All right, we're going to begin our button properties lesson here by just doing a quick overview of object properties. Each of the objects that you have in Autoplay Media Studio has a variety of properties that are configurable for it. Each of the objects has a different set of uh, properties. So obviously a web browser object and a button object would have different properties involved with them. For example, a web browser object might have a link, a web link, whereas a button, a button probably wouldn't, or in some contexts it wouldn't. So suffice to say that uh, a flash object and a text object are very different and that they contain different properties. Okay, So as we move forward this is going to become self-apparent but let's just go ahead and jump right in with button properties. So from my gallery I'm going to go ahead and select a button and pull it onto the stage and I'm going to get rid of my preview screen and pull my properties pane out. Okay, So we can get a good look at what we're doing. Now we're going to work in the properties pane but I'm just going to show you first of all a couple other ways that you can edit properties for a button. You can double click it and that will bring up this dialog where you can edit all the same properties that you could in the properties pane plus a couple different ones such as this match normal feature but we'll just press OK for now and look at a couple more ways you can bring up that same dialog you can right click on a button and choose properties or with a button selected you can choose the shortcut key of control enter and that will bring up the same dialog additionally from the object menu you can choose properties with the button selected and that will access the same dialog. And the final way I'm going to mention is in the objects pane. You can double click on any object here, which is real handy once you have a whole bunch of objects in your in your project to be able to do that here. Okay, so that's different ways you can access the edit properties dialog. In this particular case, we're going to use the properties pane. So let's just jump right in. You can see that our button has a name. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and name it something meaningful. Um, as you move along and your projects get rather large and you have a lot of objects, you want to be able to recognize them at a glance in your scripts and so forth. So I always give them meaningful names. If we're going to make, let's say, a contact us button here, we'll call we would name it contact, and then I can tell what it is just glancing at a script. Um, your end user is not going to see this, so just name it something that's meaningful to you. The next field is the file field. This is the actual button file that is underneath there. Now you can change this without changing the text. In other words, if our text said uh, click here and we changed to a button that had a different default text, it would keep our text that we have current. Okay. So for example, if I go to a blue rectangle here, you'll see that it retained my old text. I'm going to actually go ahead, jump ahead a field here and change our text. You see there's a text field here. We're just going to go ahead and set that now so we can demonstrate that again. If we go back again to the file field, click on the little ellipsis and choose now our original blue pill button again you'll see the contact us text has stayed intact so you can change the button file without changing what's on the button here Okay. the next field here is the type field and this is where you choose between standard buttons and toggle buttons you can design those in your button maker tool as we reviewed in the last lesson or you can use the ones that are available with Autoplay Media Studio. If you're selecting a, bu a toggle button such as a radio button or a checkbox, you'll have an additional option here to select the initial state of up and down, up or down rather. Um, but in the case of a standard button such as ours, that option will be grayed out. Okay. So the next field here is the text field. Obviously we already looked at that. That's going to be your caption. So you just type in whatever you'd like your button to say right there. And the next field is the font field. Now this one's kind of interesting. You can expand it and we can actually edit uh, individual aspects of the font here without affecting other ones. Um, if you prefer, you can do it from a font dialog by clicking on the ellipses here. And in the font dialog, you'll see you have options to set the font family, font style, font size, and so forth. Additionally, you have some effects here, such as underline, strike out, and anti-aliasing. Anti-aliasing, you'll probably want to leave on um, to keep your text nice and smooth unless you're using really tiny fonts in which case you'll probably want to take it off it makes it more readable um, script this is for users who would like to use other than western script for their fonts okay and we'll press ok because we're actually going to do this from this uh, properties pane here directly so let's go ahead and change the font family just by choosing one from this pull down menu okay I'm just going to actually experiment with random ones until I get one I like <coughs> that one's kind of nice but let's see I was hoping for something there we go a little more stylish now you can change your font size here as well so I'm going to click on these little arrows on the size field to change my font size 
and I'm going to leave it bold, you, but you could disengage that here, and I'm going to leave the italic style off, but again, you could change that here if you like, just by pulling this uh, little pull-down menu to say true, and I'm going to leave the alignment in the center, but if you'd like to align it to the left or the right, you can do that here, okay? And you'll notice that if I leave it in the center, which is what you'll usually do, if I come back and change the text, the text automatically centers itself on the button. So that's handy, especially if you're using any kind of dynamic labeling of your buttons. Okay, the next area here is the offsets. Now you'll notice when I chose this font, it's kind of a weird font, and I did that intentionally because I wanted something that would be off-center so we could demonstrate this. Now basically you can adjust your font using these along the X and Y axis as much as you like. So for example, if I put my my X axis to zero, I guess, yeah, it looks right, and then I add a few pixels to my Y axis, now I suddenly have centered the text on the button, so it becomes uh, a much better for my layout and much more usable. In certain cases where your button is, is heavily asymmetrical, you're going to probably need to adjust these quite a bit. But suffice to say that you can move your text around on your button and fine-tune it by using these two fields here. Okay, so that's our font field here. That allows us to change the family of the font, the size, the style, the alignment, and the offset. And I encourage you to go through and experiment with those, you know, and just play around and, and see what you can get out of it. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and change the family again before we move on, because this one's kind of weird. So I'm going to choose Arial, which is pretty common. I'm going to leave it bold. I'm going to leave the italic off, and I'm going to size it right up, and then go ahead and take that X, off, X offset back off. There we go. Perfect. Okay, let's move on to the next area here. I'm going to contract our fan font area by clicking on this little icon here and move on to the state colors area. Now, in this particular case, we've got it set so that it's white. When our mouse goes over this button, it'll be white. When we highlight, it'll be white. When we uh, click, so it'll be in the down state, it'll be white, and so forth. So if we preview it, <coughs> you'll notice here that the font color never changes. It stays white for all the states. But in this particular area of our properties pane, we can set a variety of options for that. So for example, we'll leave our up state to white. How about we'll set our highlight state to yellow. And we'll set our down state to red, maybe a darker red. And we'll set our disabled state to a gray color. Now, let's go ahead and preview again and see if how that affected our button. Now you can see that when you mouse over it, the font turns yellow. And when you click it, the font turns red. Now, this is going to be more relevant for certain types of buttons. In our case, the white worked fine, but you should go through an experiment and find the one that works for you. And actually, just to demonstrate really quickly the disabled color, if I jump ahead in our, in our palette here and turn the enabled field to false, you'll see there's our disabled font color has come through now. If I was to switch this back to white, you can see it would be white. Okay, so I'm going to actually set that enabled back to true, and we'll look at that in a sec. I'm going to set our font colors back to white and move along. But suffice to say that in this area you can change the font colors for the different states of your button. So you can also do that in the button maker tool as well. I'm going to contract that area with this little icon and go on to the attributes field. Now here's where we've got our, our sounds for our button and so forth. In the sounds field you'll notice there's a pull down menu. You can s select none, you can select standard and that's what we had selected by default or you can select custom sound files. So if you select a custom sound file, you'll actually go here in the file field, click on the ellipsis, and surf to your custom sounds. In this case, I'm in our sounds gallery within our built-in gallery in Autoplay Media Studio, and we've provided a whole bunch of uh, really great sounds here for you to get started with. But you could use your own custom sounds too and really add a lot of power to your application. So let's go ahead and choose one of these sounds. I'm going to choose triangle, and I'm going to choose for the click sound, hack. And now if I preview... I don't know if you guys can actually hear this or not, but at any rate, we have new sounds for our button. Okay, so let's move along. We'll leave those sounds in place. Now, we've got... <coughs> I've got to select our button again. There we go. We've got a cursor option, and I'm not going to demonstrate this because actually for our video tutorials here, I have um, 
apply to larger cursors, so you wouldn't see it. But I encourage you to go through and fool around with these. Basically, what it is is depending on what type of object you have or what type of uh, button you have, you might want to use a custom cursor so that when the person puts their mouse over that, they see this custom cursor. So, for example, for a search button, you might want to use a magnifying glass as a custom cursor. Or for a buy now button, you might want to use a money sign. So go through and fool around with those. We're going to leave ours set to hand. That's pretty typical. And you'll find for most applications it works well because people are familiar with it. Okay, the tool tip is the, just like an HTML tool tip. For example, when they hover their mouse over the button for more than a second or so, they're going to see this little tool tip pop up. So this is handy. Let's go ahead and type in contact us. And usually that's what you'll do is you'll, you'll use your label um, here as the tool tip. Um, what this is really good for is if you have a fairly complex project or a project that has a lot of stuff, it can keep your users from getting confused. And they can just mouse over anything at any given time and basically see what it does. So basically you want to make your tooltip descriptive of the functionality of the object. Okay, so the next field here is the enabled field that we already looked at. Now you can enable or disable your button right here. And if we were to set this to be false and preview our project, you'll see that none of the effects or anything are active for this button because it's disabled. Okay, at any given time you can easily use an action to re-enable a button or disable a button. We'll be looking at that in a minute in the next uh, set of lessons here, in the next couple lessons, but uh, suffice to say that it's very easy using actions to enable or disable a button and to set its visibility. Um, let's go ahead and set our enabled back to true and let's look at the visibility field here which is next. If you have this set to true then your button will be visible by default. If you set this to false it will not. Now we still see the button in the design environment here but if we go ahead and preview our project you'll notice that the button actually now is not visible. Again this is easy to change using an action, a simple action. So you can basically make context sensitive um, objects that basically appear or disappear or enable or disable according to other contexts within your your project. So for example uh, a print button might only be enabled on pages where there's something to print or a um, uh, play, pause, stop and fast forward button set might only be visible when there's a video on the page and then when the video is not there it would be invisible and so forth. So you can use these to great effectuality when you're constructing projects. Okay, the next ones here are kind of obvious. We've got a left and top field, and those are just uh, the position of this um, button in pixels from the top left of the canvas. So if we set this to 50, 50, it will be set so that the left top is 50 pixels to the right of and 50 pixels underneath of the top left corner. If we set it to 200 and 200, we get the same effect. So you can just drag and drop your things, or you can do it numerically here by the properties pane or in the properties dialog. Okay, we've got a width and height field. Now again, this is self-explanatory. It's basically just the size of your button. So if you wanted to go ahead now and change the size of your button numerically, you could do that here. You'll notice that you have to actually go back and change the font size too. Depending on how you have your, your button set up, um, that's basically the, uh, the way that the workflow goes. Okay, so Let's go ahead and shrink this back down. There we go. Okay, now let's move along to the actions area. I'm going to contract these. <coughs> now, we have various states for the button where we can attach actions. For example, on click, on enter, and on leave. So if you wanted something to happen when the user rolled their mouse over the button, you would put it in the on enter field. If you wanted something to happen when the user rolled their mouse off of the button, you would use the on leave field and if you wanted something to happen when the user clicked the button you would use the on click field. So for example if we attach an action here by clicking on the little ellipsis it'll bring up our actions dialog and we can go ahead and let's say let's let's attach a message box to it that says button has been clicked. Okay. So if you're not familiar with actions uh, don't worry about this too much. We'll be we'll be looking at some examples in a minute, but this is just for the purposes of demonstration. And now, when we click our button, we get this dialog telling us that we've clicked it. Okay, so that's how you'll add interactivity to your button. But since this lesson is on the button properties, the main thing we want you to know is that this is where you would actually click to initialize that actions dialog if you wanted. Now, I'm just going to take a quick tour of the 
the properties dialog instead of the properties pane to show you a couple things that are in there that aren't here in the properties pane. So if I double click our button, I'm going to come into the settings area here and you'll notice that we actually have this match normal function which is kind of neat. So let's say that we had our text colors set to this. Um, and if we were doing this in our properties pane we'd actually have to come and set these one at a time. But if we're doing it in our properties dialog, we can actually just click on this match normal button and it automatically matches the color in the normal state to the highlight and down state. So that's kind of handy. As well, you can see here in the properties dialog, it's kind of a bit of an expanded view. So it's kind of maybe a little more spacious to go through here and, and take a look at the various things. But the other thing that I wanted to show you, which you don't have um, the same in the properties pane as you do in here, is the check spelling button. So for example, let's go here and misspell the word contact. Okay, so we took the C out. You'll notice there's a little red line underneath there, and that's our spell checker. So if you press spell check, you'll notice that it now comes into this area. Now in this particular case, it suggested a correction, which didn't work out. Well, that's okay. At least we know that it spotted it, and we can go ahead and do this. Now you can also add different words to your dictionary, and you can do a variety of different functions in here as well. There's an option screen here that if you go ahead and look through this it'll give you uh, some some different uh, options for loading up dictionaries, adding dictionaries, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, So I encourage you to go through and take a look at that. But suffice to say that this is something which is not um, available in the properties pane so you may like to use the properties dialog sometimes to edit your properties. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next video tutorial. At this point you should feel fairly comfortable engaging different ways of editing the button properties such as the properties pane and the properties dialog and going through them and changing things such as the tool tip text, the title text, the name of the button, the size and so forth. Okay, so we'll move along now.